Well, welcome to this week's podcast slash vlog. We are at the top of Secalabra, which is a huge, massive climb, basically. So um, we've done this already on this holiday, haven't we? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm so cold. I've got shorts on and it's five degrees. <laughs> sure. So we thought we'd just do a quick uh, video before we headed down just to sort of show the climb itself. But we're headed down to Sacalabra, uh, to the little cove down there, just to go and do a little bit of a adventure tour because we've only ridden down here. We've never actually sort of visited and yeah. explored the area. So. so we'll do some B-roll and show you the twists and turns that you can see from the top. But it takes about half an hour to descend at my pace and then about 50 minutes to come back up again. Yeah. So it's actually a massive climb. Um, I hate going down this with a passion. I've cried both times. <laughs> I get so cold because you... And also it was slippery, wasn't it, last week when we came down? Um, so yes, welcome to this week's podcast. Catch you in a bit. Bye. Peace. So I just had a little look online because I was actually really interested to know where Sacalabra, um, why Sacalabra is. It was actually, this road was built in the 1930s, do you know? Wow. I know, like I thought it would be much older than that. And the architect, it was actually an architect that designed it to um, wind through the mountains like this. At, oh, sorry about that, everyone. At a um, really steady gradient. Uh, the guy has obviously never cycled up this road. There is nothing steady about this gradient, is there? Well, like, as you get consistently hard. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Sacalabra is actually the town, the little town at the bottom, where I don't really think many people live anymore because it just gets flooded by the 13 million tourists that visit Mallorca every year. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. So the road itself is just the A to B of getting there. So um, we will film down the bottom, but. Bye. So we thought we'd do something a little bit different today. Um, and this is one of the things I spoke about last week in terms of outside of my comfort zone and recording and going out. Um, a, kind of like, not really wanted to talk in front of the camera in public, um, but B, also kind of like, what have I got to say that's of interest to people? So we thought we'd come to this nice little cove at Sacalabra um, because we've seen on... Um, like other travel videos and stuff there's like a lovely little area to walk round to um it's where you walk through the mount they've built a tunnel through the mountain that takes you through to this next cove basically with like a secret beach and like loads of forests around you and it's closed <laughs> i can't believe it look so that's the extent of our travel video today I have to say, ironically, the cafe that we stop at pretty much every day has this sign up that says um, the Torrent de Pace is closed. And we were like, oh, we don't know what that is. That's this. <laughs> so we did know. Yeah. We just didn't know that we knew. Yeah. I didn't know. So anyway, welcome to our travel video. Yeah, welcome to our travel video of which there is no content. So you're welcome. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> So we thought that to be an unusual way to, well, not unusual, it's nothing unusual. <laughs> different. Uh, this is why we don't film ourselves out. <laughs> we thought this would be a different way to do our weekly roundup of what we've been up to the last week. Because we know everyone's so interested. So what have we been doing? Um, we moved house. <laughs> that sounds a bit extreme uh, because we don't actually live anywhere at the moment. Um, so we moved from one Airbnb to another. Um, from a place called Campanet, we moved down to Muro, a little bit more inland, away from the mountains. So, Yes, and it's got colder here, so we've had rain and um, just like below five degree weather in yeah. Mallorca, which um, is unusual. Unusual for Mallorca, but a lot but, better than what everyone in the UK's got at the moment. <laughs> yeah, sorry to hear about that storm, that sounds horrible. Um, we also had probably one of our worst bike rides yet on Saturday. Yeah, we're uh, at the end of a three-week training block, so we're a little bit tired. Uh, we did a had a hard session, a long ride, and it just got a little bit colder than we're used to, didn't it? So yeah, and the wind—I cannot even tell you how strong that wind was. Like I could, I was cycling, I was hardly moving anywhere, and. No matter what way we turned, the wind was there, wasn't it? It was just horrible. So I cried. I got so cold. I get Raynaud's, which is where you, your end of your fingers go white, and I couldn't feel my fingers. And 
it literally was horrible. Like, it was the worst ride. I think I'm still recovering from it now, like, psychologically still recovering from it. Yeah, we had an argument because I got cold and stroppy. And... <laughs> but apart from that, we've had quite a quiet week. Oh, we've been planning, actually, something really exciting, well, for us anyway. Um, we are considering, I would say we're 90% decided that we're going to go to America. Yeah. Um, whilst we're still waiting for the house to sell, if anyone wants to buy a house, it's in Dursley, 500,000, it's a bargain. You'll love it. Dursley's amazing. <laughs> I don't know why we want to leave. Um, yeah, so we're going back to the UK uh, probably for about three weeks and then we're probably going to head off to America. So, Yay! Watch this space. Peace. Peace. So we're back. We hoped you liked the weekly summary that we did in Sacalabra. Yep. Um, if not, then tough. I mean, it wasn't anything to really like <laughs> shout home about. So I don't Brazil blame you. Brazil is very don't. unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go straight into the topic this week, which is buying a house abroad. Now, a couple of disclaimers: we are not experts, obviously. No, we are. We what? need to we need to claim this. Sorry, we because are because we're on YouTube. Oh yeah, that's we're true. We're obviously experts. That's true. Um, what we do know is what we know, and that is basically surrounded by a load of research, isn't it? So yeah. we can we're quite happy with we're making big decisions based on what we've researched online. Yeah. And actually, it's really hard to gather information online. I found. And we're like what 60, 70 percent of the way through of searching, finding and speaking to the right people. We've spoken to estate agents in France and yeah. stuff like that, haven't we? So. Yeah, we're fairly confident that we know enough anyway. And also the second disclaimer is that we are actually buying with cash. And so if you, if people want information on like... Um, How to mortgage abroad. Yeah, like yeah. go look on YouTube because I've absolutely no idea. And to be fair, I think it's quite similar to the UK. There's just going to be um, exchange rate. Thing. Yeah. Even if you're not interested in buying a house abroad, this is actually quite an interesting podcast. Yeah. I thought I found out loads of really interesting stuff yeah. anyway, trying to buy abroad. Yeah. So we'll go straight into it. Um, why did we choose France? Um, familiarity, I think. Um, when you look at houses in France, they look like old English houses almost so there was almost like a sense of comfort home yeah. comfort with it um, we have been there so we kind of know what we're looking for um, but I think for our purposes we want to travel Europe and France is a really nice sort of central location isn't it for that so I think that's why we I chose France but what about you? So um, Russ always had like the dream to move to France, didn't you? Mm. I've been lucky enough to live in Spain before we met and short periods of time in the States. And so I would have chosen America over France any day. Uh, I think I would have as well. <laughs> sure. But, um, but it's unfortunately, almost impossible. It's almost impossible. Um, before I met Russ, I was, all mar I was all ready to marry an American man. Not that I'd met him yet, but I was going to I was going <laughs> to marry an American. It. Yeah. And I was going to move there. Like, that was always my dream. Yeah. Um, but when you're looking around Europe, like Russ said, I won't repeat it, it is just a great hub for us. And also, we're still quite close to our family and things. Yeah. Not literally, not as in emotionally, but we feel like we're only 12 hours away should yeah. we, you know, should they need us, which they never do. <laughs> what do you think what was the first thing you thought you needed to know about moving to France Ooh. where mm. and um, where have we chosen and why yeah so a lot of ours has been dictated by budget mm -hmm. there are some expensive places to live in France yeah. around the coast around the edges the big cities yeah. that sort of thing if you think like um, Paris, um, Monte Carlo, all of those, like Cannes, all the way down the south, they're really expensive to live, aren't yeah. they? Um, and if you just put into the, like, the estate agent searches, houses within our budget, the majority of them come up in a few locations, which tends to be around central to northern France, of which we want to try and live as far down south because of the climate, I guess. So. Yeah. So I think we are kind of compromising a little bit on the destination because uh, we're looking to move to Dordogne region, which is the bottom of Dordogne is actually quite south, isn't well, it? Well, it includes Bordeaux. It does, um, but it's also 
still expensive we're actually getting less for our money than if we just moved 100 miles up north yeah. but for Russ and I the weather is a big part of why we're moving because yeah. we love the outdoor life yeah. I guess if money was no object we'd probably choose to go a bit further south if we could yeah into sort of like the midi pyrenees sort of bordering onto the pyrenees almost but yeah. um yeah you've only got a certain amount of funds at the end of the day haven't you if yeah. you want to retire early so exactly so what um i'm just going to give a few things i guess i don't know hints and tips on what we have found out whilst we've been looking to buy and we will be buying in france in the next six months so um I'll say them and then you can add to it if you yeah, want to. Fine. So, the how obviously we're searching in the UK. Um, we will be going over to look at houses properly, but we're having to look on um, places like Right Move, which is a house search website. And what we found is that looking at houses in France on Right Move, the French estate agents load the houses on there that they think UK people with a bit more money will like yeah so or right the, uh, move, more like a holiday home or something like that maybe yeah yeah um and we were quite shocked at this weren't we so a little bit i once guess we started to understand which estate agents dealt with which houses in those regions um and i think we spoke to the estate agent yeah we, we did we found a really helpful estate agent and yeah she sent us loads of houses that <laughs> we'd never we'd seen, never seen. <laughs> and when you actually look they're not on right move but they're on their own website yeah so definitely a big hint like find the local estate agents for the areas that you're looking at definitely and then go on to their websites and just have a, yeah. have a second look at their sites the downside to that is that they won't be in english they won't translate, which is the great thing about Right Move is that they translate everything into English. When you're looking locally, it'll all be in the local language. Yeah. So there's a lot of translators out there, isn't there? There is. We just throw it into Google, don't yeah. you? But so can't rely on Right Move, um, no. and they're really clever about putting the houses they want expatriates to see yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, also, scarily, but it is just really normal is that price house prices are inflated by about twenty percent, aren't they? Yeah. They add. We think we've not gone to negotiate on a house yet, yeah. but some feedback we've had from a couple that lived over there that we think they had about 20% yeah. on, which is like that's a lot of money. Yeah, and we actually we were almost getting to the point in September where we could have put some offers in yeah. on some houses. We almost did as well. We almost didn't we? did. And this idea of offering 20% less than the list price <laughs> that is such an insult. I felt, yeah, I felt like I was insulting them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We've really got to get rid of that. Yeah, like, I know. Empathy. British. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Russ and I don't have a lot of empathy. I think no. it's just the British politeness. Yeah. Like, um, don't want to embarrass ourselves, I guess. So, um, yeah, be prepared to like massively negotiate, I think. Mm. Um, also with France, so you find a house you like, you've negotiated a price, you then pay a deposit, usually I think around 5% on that house. You, once this is paid, the buyer, so you, us, have a 14 day calling off period of which you can literally just pull out, get your deposit back and say, no, I've changed my mind. The seller cannot do that. Um, or is it maybe they keep your deposit if you change your mind? Anyway, I can't remember, but there's a calling off period. The seller is bound into that contract and I think they have to pay you a penalty if they break it. Wow. So there's like a, the sellers are quite, sorry, the buyers are quite protected in yeah. France, which is, unusual yeah. i think anyway but once that um offer has been accepted the cooling off period's finished it's really no different to buying a house in the uk no, it's it exactly takes the same. three months or whatever it is yeah. to process all the paperwork so yeah. that was a bit disappointing i'm really yeah. annoyed with the process in the uk of how long it takes to transfer a house ownership. the paperwork yeah. to be moved around. around yeah yeah so it's a shame that it's the same in france really um, so when it comes to buying a house, obviously we're buying in sterling and then we need to make sure that the offer is in euros. And so exchange rates become like really important because this, you could lose a shitload of money yeah. over exchange rates. This was something that I, you kind of know in the background, don't you? Because you kind of deal with exchange rates yeah. when you go on holiday. But when you're just transferring 100, 200 pounds, you don't tend to think <laughs> about it too much. 4% is not a lot, is it? No, but 4% on 100k is... A significant amount to be talking about then isn't it yeah i think when i lived in spain i was aware because uh we were renting out property at the time and getting that money from sterling to euro was a bit of a faff like yeah. you'd always just 
be at a loss. So what the estate agent recommended, the French estate agent recommended us to do was you have to use a currency company and they will literally switch your money at the highest, best point they can forecast. And it's just like a... What I don't want to do is I don't want to become really obsessive and like download apps and start looking at the exchange rate and go, bye bye, sell, sell. Yeah, because <laughs> the estate agent was telling us that she wasn't aware of this app, this company that kind of did all the hard work yeah. for you. And they were like watching the exchange rates religiously to try and get this optimum point for transfer. Yeah, I know. And Could you imagine doing that every yeah. day as, as well as you're like living your best life? Yeah. I think that's really you stressful. You wouldn't be living any kind of life, would you? <laughs> You'd know a lot about exchange rates. Yeah. So. Yay, what great company you'd be. <laughs> um, so, yeah, use a company to manage that for you. And I think we're going to do that. And they, of course, they're going to take a small percentage, yeah. but I think it might they benefit us. Yeah. A lot of the stress, anyway. So, buying a house in France, like if you've ever looked at houses in France, you just, it's insane what you can get for your money. Yeah. It's almost unbelievable. Um, but don't be led into a false sense of security because you get. Um, so say we've got like a 60 to 100k budget, that will get us like a two to three bedroom property that looks like it's from the 1920s. It will have an outbuilding that's just about standing and it will have about four acres of land that you can't do anything with. Yeah. So it's so easy, we found, didn't we, to be, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff we can get for our money. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, it's pretty useless. Yeah, and then we're like, oh, we want to go traveling for three months at a time we don't want to come back to a four forest. acres of land that needs to be mowed and maintained and all of that yeah so it's that's a really good point actually so if you're a family that might be quite different but yeah. our lifestyle is going to be traveling going back home traveling yeah. going back home yeah. so it's like um most properties you see will need work you're probably going to need to budget like another 20k unless you've got a budget of like 300,000 yeah then yay, good for you. Like yeah. you'll get an amazing. You're house. probably not watching this YouTube video. <laughs> the um, one of the houses we looked at, I think it had about twelve acres of land or something like that. It was like a couple of hectares, and the land was maintained by the local farmer on the basis that the farmer took the grass that they then cut um, to and use it for hay. hay and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So you can, if you've got lots of land that's can be managed by yeah. a farmer you can often get agreements with local farmers and i thought to myself why do i What's want that point? land I well at least it's so at least it's maintaining it and keeping it for him yeah and that's obviously been like something that's for years and years has been agreed yeah. so well that particular house had a lovely view across the, the meadow didn't yeah. it so it would always remain your meadow yeah. it would just be mowed by the farmer this is the house we almost bought yeah. actually so we didn't in the end which yeah anyway Not yet. Um, so most houses will also, they have septic tanks in France because not everyone's connected to main drains. Actually, I would say probably very few properties are because they're out in the sticks, basically. Yeah. And most septic tanks aren't up to regulation. So you will probably need to build in about 10K to have them replaced. However, the estate agent said you get a, a year's grace by like the local mayor or whatever to update your septic tank they kind of never check on you yeah. <laughs> so she was like listen to that but you know just go about your life and be <laughs> friends with the mayor and <laughs> just budget for it that one day you might have to yeah yeah exactly so they're they're trying to make sure that shit's not leaking into the land like literally basically um a couple of the houses we looked at they've had them done but i'm gonna say that we're probably gonna have to budget in yeah. 10k in the next 10 years i mean we're looking at houses that are less than a hundred thousand yeah. pound aren't yeah. we or a hundred thousand euros and i think those ones definitely need doing but maybe if you're buying something for more than that it might be more yeah. up to standard yeah. they might have connected it to the yeah. mains whatever there was one house that was advertised as having termites oh we'll show it we'll do b-roll yeah. over this and show it's it it's actually we keep seeing it well i keep seeing I it i do and i keep <laughs> looking at it because it's actually a really nice house really good value for money yeah, that's a really good point so termites um, because a lot of the houses in France are made of wood, oak, still traditionally, uh, because they're so old, um, naturally they're going to start to have termite issues. And so that's what you got termite issues. They're really hard to treat, yeah. aren't they? The whole house has to be fumigated for months and months. Yeah, but it's the seller's responsibility to ensure that the termites have gone 
and you are left with almost like a warranty, I guess, by the, the people that... I guess so. I'm really nervous about it, but it means that some houses are really cheap yeah. because they've had termites, and as soon as you hear termites, you're like, that's yeah. disgusting. And then we looked at another house that had some evident of, evidence <laughs> of <she> woodworm, was... <laughs> and she completely played it down. And this, well, A, it's not the seller's responsibility to get rid of woodworm, and you just wrap it in cling film and job done. Yeah. And I haven't checked this, but it seems a little bit... I also remember her saying, it's not a problem. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, it's just woodworm. And literally this oak beam is half <laughs> hanging. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I think this is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I touched on it earlier, but another thing we found out, which I think a lot of people know but don't really understand, is that um, French towns are so, like, insular and small. Um, we think they look, they're like the 1920s of England. Yeah. Like how I imagine England was probably pre-war. Um, and the local mayor has a massive say and massive respect in that local town. And you can have a town or a village with like five houses and it will still have a massive mayor office. Yeah. And so befriending the mayor is a huge requirement. And it sounds like a really cheesy thing that you have to do, but it's like you won't be able to open your Airbnb, you wouldn't be able to... Life would become building, uncomfortable. Like all building planning yeah. and regulations and stuff goes like through anything. the mayor. Yeah. Getting a swimming pool installed would go through the mayor. Yeah. yeah. So you have to go introduce yourself. Um, take him a crate of wine. Take him. Okay. We're not obviously suggesting they like bribes, but take him something. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and yeah, I thought that was really... So we're, um, we're not that social of people. So yeah. for us, that will be pushing us outside our comfort zone yeah. and probably in another language. Yeah. Because a mayor in the middle of wherever might not necessarily speak English. No. Or Want might, to. might make you speak French. Just because. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of it. Like, in terms of what we found out, we're going to find out more because we haven't actually bought a house yet. And I'm yeah. sure once it's all gone through, we'll learn a hunt like a million other things. The reality is, it's not too dissimilar to buying a house in the UK, is it? Yeah. In terms of searching, going through the estate agents, you have effectively the same thing as the UK with a solicitor. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but it's we'll insert. Yeah, but it is exactly the same it process, is. really. They don't seem to have um, surveys on houses. However, you do have a full written report from the estate agent. Now, I would always question anything that's from someone trying to sell it. Yeah, but surveys aren't really a thing and I think they're probably quite insulted if you ask for one yeah. it's very much on a handshake over in France isn't it yeah. it's quite a trusting um, way to do something yeah. I think take a builder with you take a builder yeah right <laughs> British builder oh yeah Hope yeah you not. need that doing love <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna cost you a lot <laughs> So I think our intention, we may have touched on this, is to, we've got a limited budget, so the house we will buy will need some work on it. And our key, our primary task is to um, Airbnb it, because it will be a source of income for us. Now, buying a house is actually quite straightforward. The visa side and residency side of things isn't quite so much yeah. because of Brexit. <laughs> so you can easily buy a house in France, but you can't really live in it. Full time. Full time, yeah. We could, but what's the process we'd have to go through to do that? Are we going through that now? Just quickly. Yeah. Like very, just so, a very quick overview. Uh, three months automatic, like visa through the Schengen region um, since we left the European Union. And then you get a long stay visa to take you up to 12 months. So it's like a nine month visa and effectively. Um, after that, you go through the residency processes. So it will be like a one year residency permit. Maybe you can get a three year or a five year residency permit. And then once you've kind of done that for a few cycles, I think you can then apply for like a 10 year residency permit. But you're always on a fixed term residency process never really fully becoming a citizen. French citizen you're like you're classified as a French citizen but only for the period of your visa yeah and each of those visa steps uh, like we said we won't go into it now have their upsides and downsides so the decision we've taken because we still want to travel quite a lot 
to Indonesia, Asia, America. We're going to be three months in France in our home, probably during the winter months because we'll rent it out in the summer and then we'll spend three months somewhere else and we'll just keep rotating, yeah. sticking to the EU current visa guidelines, basically. Yeah. The 90-day rule, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You definitely need to weigh up the benefits of going through the residency process it versus can be some big remaining costs. in a UK resident. Yeah. yeah, big cost. And if you've got a lot of money in savings or inheritance or anything like that, you really want to weigh that up. And then you could talk to an expert. Like yeah. There are loads of people that would be able to yeah. help you with that. Yeah, if you, if you go down the residency process, you have to transfer your tax residence to France or to the country that you're moving to. And, uh, yeah. and then you come under all the tax laws in terms of income tax, inheritance tax, capital gains tax and everything. So yeah, it's that's not bore people. Definitely something to think about, yeah. As soon as someone says tax, everyone's like, well, it's yeah. like pensions, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, what does that mean? No, I, I mean myself, I'm like... So enough of that. We hope it helped. It's only basic information. Yeah. We're not experts. And we'll tell you more as we learn more. Um, but anyway, always ask questions if you've got anything because I've got a lot of information in my brain that I don't necessarily want in there. So I'm sure <laughs> there's something I can help you with. Fun facts. I really struggled with fun facts. Well, we were trying to do fun facts on moving abroad and that's like... There's nothing fun about it. <laughs> there is. It's just moving abroad. It's not really a, a fit. It's no. A one thing, is it? Anyway, you can go first. Oh, thanks. Um... The International Organization for Migration has quoted 281 billion migrants moved in 2020. I'm sorry, what? 281 billion? Billion worldwide people moved from one country to another. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I think that's awesome, actually. Yeah. I wonder where most of them were. You know me, you've got to give more information. I've, I've got How that, many but people... it's another fact. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pissed on my firework. <laughs> okay, so this is my interesting fact. I genuinely found this interesting. I say this every week, like, I genuinely found this. Bahrain is the most popular country to move to abroad. Bahrain? Yeah. Oh, why have I never heard of Bahrain? What? It's in the Middle East. Okay. You've never heard of Bahrain? Like no. Saudi, think of Saudi Arabia okay. and Bahrain because it's a tax haven. You right. don't pay tax on your earnings. Right, okay. Full like stop. a Dubai type place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bahrain, Dubai. Yeah, yeah, nice. Practically the same place. <laughs> Comment if you've also <laughs> never heard of Bahrain. Oh my gosh, Bahrain. It's like, I know it. Anyway. The only reason why I, I know Bahrain cheese there. is because of the cycling team. Bahrain Merida. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I know, but I didn't ever know what Bahrain was. They'd, you're so welcome. It's a country. Yeah. Oh. You're welcome. Okay. Um, <laughs> to answer your previous question of where did they come from, the migrants. Cotton Eye Joe. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it won't come as any surprise that it's the majority of uh, the higher populated countries. So India, Mexico, China, Russia, and then Syria's on the list, obviously, from forced of migration. Course. Yeah. Oh, so that includes... Refugees. Oh, right, yeah. okay, that makes more sense, yeah. Migrants, you tend to think more of refugees, don't you, with that word, than yeah. emigrant, emigrating for some reason. Although it's the same thing. Yeah. That's interesting. Where did they go? Cotton Eye Joe. Well, I've got top destinations. I don't have um, Bahrain on here, but i got the USA, Germany. No, but if you think if they're, if they're migrants, so people from like um, Syria and things are being given home in places to live in like US, Germany, like that makes sense. Yeah. If you're people choosing to emigrate. You're still a migrant. But yeah, but you're... You're someone who's choosing, choosing to, to, and you've got some wealth yeah. and home and all those yeah, sorts of yeah. things, then you choose to go to Bahrain because you get richer. Okay, fine. And it's nice weather. Yeah, fine. I don't have the breakdown of the it's okay. choice I'll versus necessity, unfortunately. I'll forgive you. <laughs> okay, over 500,000 Brits moved abroad last year. 500,000? Half a million, wow. of which the majority were over 65. I think. 18% were over 65. 14% wow. were our age range. Nice. Good for on work. Them. 
for yeah. work purposes. Yeah, I've got some wider people move. Yeah, that is all I've got. Okay. I'm out of fun facts. Oh, you're out of fun facts yeah. completely. Russ has got a massive sheet. No, I'm that. gonna miss that one. That one's boring as well. So, <laughs> Were you, was my last one boring? No, you said boring no, as well. Sorry, you missed one, didn't you? <laughs> Which we cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so, last one from me. Five hundred and forty billion dollars <laughs> was sent back home from migrants. So oh my gosh! No. Well, so in terms of helping the worldwide economy, five hundred and forty billion dollars. Do you know what? I don't want us to turn into a political podcast. That's unbelievable. Yeah. As in, like, a, I feel bad that they have to. Yeah. Like, isn't that shocking yeah. that people are away from their family having to earn yeah. money? Wow, five hundred and forty billion. Yep. Yeah. Shit. So, reasons why people move. Fifteen percent actively found a job in another country and moved because of the job. Is that the highest? That's the highest, 15%. So majority of people move for work? Yeah, well, 10% move because they were recruited by a company in another country. God, it's all to do with work. So that's 25% straight away. Yeah. 9% sent by their employer. Oh my gosh, it's all work. And 6% sent uh, moved for their partner's job. Holy crap. So all of a sudden, that's what, 15, 24, 30% of people move yeah. because of career. And you know what? That's so interesting. A, I've moved, moved abroad for a job or travelled a lot abroad for a job. And I know a handful of people that have moved for their work. Yeah. But I never even thought about that would yeah. be a reason. Um, How many people move because they want to? Um, well, as in like 10% moved country to live with their partner so they obviously met somebody their partner was from a different country and they moved because they wanted to be with them yeah uh, nine percent study so the first one as a personal choice is eight percent number six better quality of life wow is that all yeah oh my gosh and that's the, so interesting and then five percent at number nine adventure or personal challenge. So we're in the top 5% or the bottom 5%? Bottom 5%. 5 <laughs> Only 4% globally for retirement. Really? Yeah. Gosh, that's interesting. Yeah. That was very interesting fun facts. Thanks. Yeah, we'll put up those percentages because I'm sure uh, they'll be really interesting yeah. for people. We'll leave them in the comments so that you can print them off and study them. Okay, being as I'm so against work, I'm actually just genuinely disappointed in all of those people. Yeah. I need you to get a job <laughs> abroad to go and live abroad. I think that goes to show like how reliant society is yeah. on income and work. Employment, and employment. stability, yeah. routine. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but I also think that that's really sad. Yeah. People aren't day. doing things because they want, want to. to, they're doing them because they yeah. are forced to. Don't yeah. get me wrong, like if you move abroad working and it gives you a better standard of living, so like you go to Australia and it's sunshine and your kids can play on a beach and you get more hours of vitamin D a day, like that is great, isn't it? But that person working is still working a nine to five, yeah. not living in Australia. But maybe they've got a better out. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I don't it's know. a secondary effect of going yeah. with, because of work is a better standard of life and adventure and fun and lifestyle and all of that so it kind of comes into it but the primary reasons are majority because of work wow that's so interesting yeah. i'd be so interested to know if anyone watching this has done that has moved abroad for work or has like traveled abroad i don't know why i'm interested in that actually i don't think i am don't worry about it i'm <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to move abroad? That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Would, if you didn't have to move abroad and have an income, would you? And where would you go? Where would you go? Oh, where would yeah. you go? That's a good one. We've often talked about going to Australia because obviously the sunshine and the standard of living there. Man, I cannot deal with the bugs and yeah. the snakes and the spiders. So We wouldn't last very long, would we? That's a no. Yeah. Would you like that? I wouldn't like it, no. Mm. I think I could tolerate it, but... I think I'd be on edge. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. 
Uh, thanks again. Podcast three. Thanks again for watching. Yeah. Let us know. Uh, we'll do a poll to, so you can choose next week's subject, but we've got a few ideas anyway. Yeah. If you follow us on Instagram, you'll be able to see the poll and vote. Yes, and please subscribe, comment, share. We have 24 subscribers. Our last video had 295 views. We'd love for it to start to do No, that better. was the first video. Oh, that was the first. Oh, yeah, this is the third. Yeah. I don't know what our second podcast is doing at the moment. Yeah. Anyway. It's not great. Look, bear with us. We're learning, right? Yeah. Just lower your expectations. Yeah. <laughs> be kind. Oh. And this is our new house in Mura. Oh yeah, this is our Mura. We can't actually film inside because it's it's a bit dark. Yeah. And I'll see if I can do something. Do some B roll. But this is beautiful. I'll probably put some B roll over the first section yeah. of the weekly roundup. Yeah. Of what we're doing, yeah. So thank you for joining us. We hope this was useful, interesting, funny, and all those things that make you feel good. And we will see you next week. Peace. Peace. Mm -hmm.